Hi, everyone. Um, it's good to be alive. It's good to be again in the presence of our King and Savior. Today, we will be going into a whole new series. It's uh, exciting, and uh, I'm um, <clears throat> eager to see how this turns out, how it turns out uh, to our blessings and uh, even to our growth as we uh, transform from step to step into the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Today, the series we're going to begin is uh, we will be investigating the impartiality and the unrelenting love of God. We're going to be looking at the justice of God, the way he perceives justice and uh, his unrelenting love for his children. Uh, today, we're going to read the first three verses in the book of Hosea. Uh, we'll be going to some other text, but for today, we will uh, stay with the book of Hosea. In the first chapter of Hosea, we read, The word of the Lord came to Hosea, son of Beri, during the reigns of Hosea. Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Goma, the daughter of the blame, and she conceived and bore him a son. In verse 4, it says, Then the Lord said to Josiah, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel, in that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. It's a very interesting book in itself. The book of Hosea is one of those books, if you will agree with me, that seems to be filled with a lot of what we may what what we may consider contradiction in the word and in the character of God. But when you take your time or you, you just take a little bit of care to look and study this book, it will reveal that God is impartial. He is relentless in his love to his children and to humans. And oftentimes, a lot of other religions have always quoted these passages like I just read now to state that the Bible has been adulterated, or that God cannot be a loving God because he approved of so many wars or promiscuity, abuse of women and children that were killed. Some would even claim that it seemed to be unperturbed by the wickedness and injustices going on in the world. Well, before we deal with that, I want to go back to the passage that we read, beginning from verse 2. I, I would like to add to this aspect. In verse 2, it says, when the Lord began to speak to Hosea, and, and the idea that we can bring to surface here is that there was a time when God began to speak to Hosea, which means, whether we like it or not, Hosea was a young prophet. And just imagine a young prophet assuming to be hearing from God and being told, hey, young prophet, go and marry a promiscuous woman. I understand why some people will find it difficult to understand why God will begin his ministry through this man like that. But let us draw the line. In the first place, the people who see God in the negative light 
they are first of all those group of people who are not able to perceive the love of God because they have been blinded to the truth and the reality of who God is and his word. The Apostle Paul didn't hide this. He literally puts it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning from verse 3 to 4. He says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In other words, these people have not believed in Christ. They have not been forgiven their sins. And the confusion that they are experiencing is because anyway, they are on the path of destruction. The reason is simple. The God of this age has blinded the mind of such unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Paul is saying it is not as if the gospel is viewed. The real problem is that the enemy wants the unbeliever to remain in his blindness so that this blindness will keep this unbeliever in his path of destruction. I would like to emphasize that that is the big aspect of considering God as a God of contradictions. If you look all around you, you will see that things have been messed up because of our sin. Except for those who refuse to accept this fact that man's sin broke the world. The sin of man broke the world. The harmony, the bliss that the world was supposed to be given or to, to, for man to receive from his environment, they were all broken by the fall of man. And that is one reason that Christ came. He came to restore and reconcile all things back to himself and to the Father, the way the Father had conceived them in eternity past. Hear what the Apostle Paul has to say. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, it says, And through him, that is Christ Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether the things on earth or the things in heaven, by making peace through his blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. Hear this. Christ came to reconcile all things to himself, whether it is the climatic change or the wars that are taking place or people who are hurting each other, he has come for the purpose of stopping all the things that are outside of the will of God, bringing them back into subjection unto the authority that he has and submitting all to God. So although people may say that God is aloof to the plight of man, they just need to look at Christ for them to see the effort that God has put in for the remedy of the chaos that we see. Just imagine, God has been working in eternity past to bring about subjection and order and harmony in creation that he made and put in the hands of men. Let me show you how God did that. Because the people who consider God a God who is aloof, a God who is contradictory to his creation, this is one aspect that they probably have not seen. Who does this kind of thing? He gave his best for this reason. That is Jesus Christ. He did not just send some angels or send in some force or some energy. What he did is that from eternity past, he discovered that there is nothing who can satisfy his need for bringing back harmony and reconciliation. 
The only place that he found the answer was in his own only begotten son. I mean, I need those people who do not see God as a God who cares to answer that question. Who does it to give the only begotten son for a sacrifice? God has been working, dear friends, to restore chaos. And you know what? The chaos was not made by God. The chaos was brought upon us by ourselves. Look at this profound statement here about the fact that God, the Father of Jesus Christ, has been walking. And what he has been doing is to bring redemption to man and the harmony that the entire cosmos needs. Let's put it like this. It's like somebody just came home and said, Daddy, Daddy, I just discovered that all the other kids, they have this whatever gadget, and you are so aloof, you don't care, you have not given. And the dad suddenly smiled and said, son, what do you mean? Before you were born, I bought that gadget for you. I was just waiting for the day that you're going to say you need it. That is the work that God has invested in. And Jesus made an allusion to that fact in chapter 5 of John, verse 16 to 18. Hear what Jesus said. He says, so, because Jesus was doing these things on Sabbath, and these are part of those who criticize the work of Jesus Christ, because they have been blinded by the God of this world. For them, Sabbath was not a day that you do good. Sabbath was not a day that you heal people. Sabbath was a day that you become aloof to the needs of everybody. But God already made provision for that even before they discovered. And, and, and hear this. The Jewish leaders, they began to persecute him. And in verse 17, in his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always walking. Even before you begin to criticize me for Sabbath, before you were born, before you even understand that there is a God, my Father is always working. And he's at work this very day, even on the very same Sabbath that you think I shouldn't do good. And I too, I am working. For this reason, they all try the more to kill him. Isn't that ironic? Jesus is saying, look, you didn't even know that I have been working to try to save man and bring peace and love and harmony. Now that I am expressing it to you, you are angry that I made you discover the truth that you barely knew or you did not know. And then the more they try to kill him. It just looks like the 21st century. When you meet people on the street, they are angry at God. They are absolutely anti-Christ because they think if God really exists, he is aloof and absent. And then you present to them that for this reason, the Son of Man died. He rose again so that we can have access to God and the very peace that we need, we can have it. Hey, that's the very same reason they get even more angry and they separate from the word of God. It's a very ironic thing. But this is what I want you to hear. It is out of God's love for man that he sent his only begotten son to die. It is not because God loves bloodshed. But out of his love, he would not keep the only the only formidable and acceptable solution from man. I do not understand if the world or the church or us can understand this fact today, that God had no choice because he is a God of law. He had to bring out his very best because it is his very best that could meet the need. 
And I want each and every one to, men to just meditate on this aspect today. Who among us will give his only begotten son for the life of the other? Does that touch our heart? Does that make us perceive God in a much different light? It is out of his love for man that he sent his only begotten son to die. Somebody may say, Pastor Tony, but you said we're going to be studying from the book of Hosea. We will not depart from it. It's just that you needed to hear that aspect that although the way God has done things, they all seem contradictory to what we may perceive as righteousness or what is good. What do all of these things I'm talking about have to do with the book of, of, of Hosea? I put it like this. It has everything to do with it. The reason is simple. The love of God is so deep that even in itself, the act of the love of God is so, so deep that when you are experiencing and seeing that way that God is displaying his love, it looks like so contradictory. It goes to one simple answer. It proves that God is love. The way the Apostle Paul puts it is so phenomenal. He says, he says, uh, 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 he, says he would not even spare his son from suffering. Wait. I have neighbors who don't like me, who probably want me dead, who don't like me when they see me in the morning, and then I hear that they have problem. Then I run back into my house, and I take my only begotten son, think of it, and I say, take, sacrifice him, so that you will not die. Who does such a thing? I am yet to see anybody who will sacrifice their only begotten, talk more for their enemies. Paul calls us the enemies of God. We were no people because we live in sin and our sin caused us to create a wall of separation between us and God. And then that same God ran back into his court, into his palace, and brought out his son and said, die for these people who are my enemies. And Apostle Paul understood this contradictory aspect of the way of God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 31 to 32, it says, what then shall we say? Shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us. And I understand why God put that. If I am God's enemy, if I was God's enemy, at the time that I did not know God, when I loved and relished sin and lived by sin and wake and died and sleep by sin, God sent his only begotten son to die for me. How much more now that he has changed my name and made me his child? What can separate me from the love of that father. Hallelujah. I want somebody to understand what I'm saying this morning. When I used to wake up to worship the devil, he had his leash on me. He takes me wherever he wants to go. He humiliates me and humiliates God through me. And even then, God had made provision for me. In the fifth chapter of Romans, God said, in that while we were yet sinners, while we were weak and without power, he sent his only begotten son to die for us. How much more now that we have become his friend? Verse 32 brought it to a perfect head. He said, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will we not also, along with him, graciously give us all things. Can I hear some hallelujah? Think of it. We have been on this place for a long time. 
The devil has lied to us and is still lying to us. He's deceiving the people in the world about the aspect of God's love. Oh yes, it is contradictory. If I want to love you, why should I die to love you? I just love you. But God doesn't do it like that because for him, it is not satisfactory. For him, it is not deep enough. He would rather die to show his love for you than just love you cheaply. I understand that that looks like contradictory, but it is love. But it is the true essence of what love is all about. I want you to understand there are the reason that people are considering God a contradictory or an absent father is the fact that they are blind. And not only are they blind, they have not allowed themselves to experience this love that God is. The psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Except you taste him, you will never understand this. Let me show you something else about this contradictory aspect of the love of God. Remember, we started by saying to this series, we'll be titled The Impartiality and the Unrelenting Love of God. And we are starting to look at this from the contradictory aspect of our own perception. Hear this, love by death. Who demonstrates love? By sacrificing their only begotten son. Is that not contradictory? Oh, oh, John, I love you so much. I love you, I love you. Just wait, then I take my son. I kill him because I love John. Guys, does that make sense? Who, tell me, who among us would want to love like that? Huh? Oh, I love your children so much. Let me kill my own children so that your own children will live. Huh? I'm hearing you all say, no, you guys don't love. <laughs> that is why it feels and seems so contradictory when God is loved, when God is loving. But I want to say, God, I thank you. I thank you because you are contradictory in the way you love. Thank you for the contradiction that your love poses. Because had you not been so contradictory, where will I be today? Where will you be today? Hear this. Just hear this. Now you can understand this part of John so well. And that's just John chapter 3. It says in verse 16, for God so loved the world. What do we have in the world? Evil, liars, politicians, kidnappers, druggers, abortionists, haters, slanderers, all the bad things that you can mention, they are in the world. But hear this. It says, for God so loved the world. The love that God has for the world made him, hear this, that he gave his only begotten son I see everybody's moving, right? That, that thing, the, 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 the Nigerian language, you say, it passed me. This is beyond me. This is beyond me. How would you love a bunch of losers that are supposed to be punished? You love them so much, you went back to your palace and say, you prince, you die for them. You die for them. This is why the love of God is so contradictory. This is why those who have not accepted Jesus do not understand it. He says that whoever believes in him shall what? Not perish, but have eternal life. But you may not understand. And he puts it like this. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Hallelujah. That is why it is confusing for a lot of people. And so you see that as we study the book of Hosea, you're going to be seeing a lot of contradiction in the way God did things. But if you now understand that these contradictions are needed to prove the validity of the love of God, the relentless, the, the intensity of the love of God for us, it will not be a difficult thing for you. Let me show you something else 
that is contradictory. Do we have enough food in the world today? Is there a lot of suffering? Is there poverty? Is the money able to buy anything? Okay, but hear this. Who chooses to become poor so that other people can be rich? Uh, please, I need you to, to raise up your hand if you have seen. Eh? So that I can tell that person, please be poor so that I can be rich. Do you think that the richest man on earth will be willing to become poor so that the world will be rich? Isn't that why we are suffering? Because those who have, <coughs> keep, excuse me, they keep keeping it away. They don't want it to get to us. But this is the other contradictory aspect of who God is. Hear what Paul says about this same God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, he says, For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he, Jesus, was rich, Jesus is rich, oh, he created everything, he owns this cosmos. But here, yet, for your sake, he became poor. So that through his poverty, you might become rich. I don't understand. I don't understand. How does he do it? Why did he do it? To make himself poor. So that what? You, you, and you, and I can be what? Rich. It's too much. It is too much. So all the people who are having concern about the nature of God, this is what they do not understand. But let me show you another contradiction. If this God is unbelievable, it's believable. <laughs> it is, you can discover him. Let me use that word. Who makes the innocent person guilty so that the guilty person will become innocent? Eh? Look at it. You killed, you are the one that killed somebody. And then suddenly he now comes and says, okay, from now on, this is what will happen. I will say I killed that person. Now you are free. Does it make sense? Look at me. Who would be happy for somebody to take your dad and say he's now the criminal so that the real criminal will be free? Eh? I see you are all getting angry already. Eh? What would you do for somebody to take your parents and say they are the criminal and we all know they are not the criminal so that the people who are real criminals will be free? Can you see it? That is the contradictory love of God. But just let me show you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the Apostle Paul understood this. He said, God made Jesus, <clears throat> who knew no sin, to become sin. I, I don't understand. Just please look at it with me. It's like a girl that is clean that nobody has ever defiled. And you now say clearly, before everybody, you are defiled. And then you now take a prostitute from the street and you say, you are clean. How does it feel? Eh? How does it feel? That's what the scripture is saying. He said, God made him, that is Jesus, who had no sin, to be seen, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You guys don't even understand what I'm saying. So now, everything <clears throat> that the Lord considers righteous is in us. I am now the righteousness of God. You and you and you and you and you and everybody, we are now what? Do you feel like that? 
Because when we look at what is going through our mind, we know we are not righteous people. This God is unfathomable. To make Jesus become sin, so that when I'm now walking on the street or wherever I go, the angels see me and now say, behold, the righteousness of God. It is very, uh, uh, in pidgin language, you say, pass me. It's too much. It is beyond me. It is beyond me. That is why people don't like God. Because for them, who will do such a thing? <clears throat> who will do it? Can you see this? God is contradictory, not in the sense of self perjury like to lie. That's not what it is. But in the sense that he will do what seems contradictory for us to bring us salvation. He will go to every extent and to redeem us to himself. Hear the prophet. This is with this, we are going to close for today. We'll, we'll, because I say it's a series and I want you to really understand it. But dear, hear this. The prophet Isaiah, he gives us the image of what the contradictory aspect of God is when it comes to forgiveness. Who has ever seen a red lipstick? We've all seen it, right? You remember those of you who are older, those red things that women used to rub on their neck, also, you see, you know, it's very red. Very, very red. That's what I'm going to read to you now. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Come now, let us settle the matter. This whole question, this whole contradiction of God, of this and this, and all the things you are talking about, God, let us settle it, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, red, Red, red as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Okay, couldn't God just wash the scene a little bit <laughs> and make it maybe maybe slightly yellow or brown? But God doesn't work like that. He will wash the scene so that you can never find it again. That's what he was saying to the psalmist. As far as the east <clears throat> is from the west, so is it. When I forgive my sins, your sins, you can never, until the day East can catch West, that's when you can find your sin, but they can never catch each other. Hey, I don't even know what language I should be telling you to speak, to thank God this evening, to thank God this evening. Although the devil confuses us with our need, it makes us feel everything is bad, but I want to have a friend who is as controversial and contradictory as God, because I know why he does what he does. He didn't stop there. He says, though they may be as red as crimson, they shall be what? As wool, gentle, clean, and fluffy. This is just the introduction for today, my dear precious friend, as we begin this series on the impartiality and the unrelenting love of God. As we begin to study the book of Hosea, we'll be experiencing a lot of this contradictory acts of God, of his impartiality and relentless love for you. I'd like to start to round up by saying, he loves me, I cannot say why. He loves you, I cannot say why. I on Calvary Street, he suffered for me. He loves me. I cannot say why. Dear friends, maybe your, be your head is bowed right now. Maybe you don't feel clean. Maybe it feels like God does not care. Maybe it seems that the heavens is just so quiet. Maybe it seems that you are so besieged all around you with need, with so much trouble. But I can tell you this, he is not silent. He is unrelentlessly pursuing to bring solution, to show you his love, because he already proved the best by causing Jesus Christ to die for you. May the Lord bless you, and may the Lord grants us the grace 
we will begin our, our study of the book of Hosea next week.